I'm losing my home in another month. They lost the house. You can't keep your home if you don't have a job. <laughs> From Michigan Radio, this is Facing the Mortgage Crisis. I'm Christina Shockley. Michigan's unemployment rate is the highest in the nation. Nobody has jobs. Everybody's house is ending up at the curb. It's just a bad situation. And the foreclosure problem doesn't just hurt people, it hurts communities. One turns into two, turns into three, and no one wants to be on those blocks that have that sign that says foreclosure, or has, you know, the high grass. It spreads like wildfire in this kind of economy. Now that we're in this situation, what can we do about it? Over the next hour, we'll hear about state laws and programs that can help. And we'll talk with some who are trying to pick up the pieces and adapt to what life brings after foreclosure. So I just keep busy and I keep working hard. And I know eventually it's going to turn around. It's just this can't go on forever. The news is next. From Michigan Radio, this is Facing the Mortgage Crisis. I'm Christina Shockley. Michigan's foreclosure rate is among the worst in the United States. The problem is threatening our state, our cities, and our neighborhoods. And people from all walks of life are being affected, blue-collar and white-collar, in cities and in suburbs. Over the next hour, we're going to find out what's being done to deal with the crisis and what happens when people can't avoid foreclosure can't keep your home it's if you don't have a job. to go from A1 credit to feeling like you're a failure. It's hard to even put it into words. It's just so overwhelming. You grow a lot faster when you have to deal with something like that. A lot of homeowners will break down. I met Debbie Gillum last year. At the time, she was about to lose her home to foreclosure after she lost her job. And the worst part is going to be moving in with my mother down the street, having to drive by this house every single day, just seeing someone else in your home, you know? It's going to be hard. I got this small ray of hope that even if I do that worst case scenario comes to that point and somebody gets this house, I just pray that's just like a first home for them. In three or four or five years, they're going to want to move up to something bigger. And I'll be right at the door saying, I'm your buyer. I want this house back someday. Now, a year later, Debbie Gillum still lives with her mom. She continues to work through the transition and deal with the loss of her house. Owning my own home was just really important to me. It just... It gave me a constant project. I was always working on something in my house, always. It's just, that's a passion for me, and now I don't have that option. I got to take over a room here, and I've totally, completely redone that. <laughs> I've created a mini apartment in a little 9 by 11 room, and it's my office, it's my living room, and it's my bedroom, and it's working out pretty well for me, actually. <laughs> I have no hope of getting my house back. They're obviously renovating to stay there forever. <laughs> You know, yeah, I kind of hoped once I got back on my feet, this would be like maybe an investor who was looking to turn it around or something. But when I talked to the guy, he said, oh, no, he's like, this is for us. We're moving in. And his wife's got him changing everything. Even though I had perfectly nice cabinets in the kitchen, she wanted something different. She got it. <laughs> I've, I've had two, what started out to be barely as big as the house, blue spurs next to the house that have like doubled in size in the time I lived there. And he took those out, and that was kind of heartbreaking to see. It's like, oh, my gosh, my big trees are gone. <laughs> but I can't blame them. They were huge. <laughs> but it's just, you know, it's funny the things you get attached to, and it's just you don't even realize it. Unless people have been through it, it's really hard to talk to people about it because they just don't understand it, or they just think you're not doing something right. So to have moral support, I think, is really important. And that's something I was really lacking through this process because, I don't know, no one else in my family, none of my friends have really been through it. I still try really hard to be optimistic, and I'm just never, I've never been a quitter. So as frustrated as I get, and it, it does seem sometimes like every passing day I just get more and more hopeless, but I don't allow myself to sit there and dwell on that because if I did, I'd go crazy. So I just keep busy and I keep working hard and 
I know eventually it's going to turn around. It's just this can't go on forever. Debbie Gillum is still looking for a full-time job and someday hopes to own a house again. lots of statistics about the foreclosure crisis, about how many people have lost their homes, how much money the banks are losing, and what that means to the economy. But as Rena Miller reports, there's another statistic we don't hear much about. People who have lost their homes are about to, or are afraid they will, are paying an emotional price. Linda Johnson is 62 years old. She's a retired elementary school principal. She has a Ph.D., and she almost lost the home she's owned for 30 years. Johnson's home was paid off, but she took a new mortgage to pay for her daughter's education. She believed she was getting a fixed-rate loan at 6.5% interest. What Johnson actually got was an adjustable-rate mortgage that jumped to 12%. She felt duped, but for her, there was something much worse. I'm very angry at myself for not reading it more carefully. It's hard for me to talk about it because it's admitting to everyone that I As a reading teacher, I didn't read carefully. (laughs) Johnson tried to tackle the problem herself. She worked with her lender for a year, trying to reduce the interest rate. She spent hours on hold and being shuffled from person to person. Johnson's lender eventually cut her interest rate to 11.5%. It wasn't enough. The payments were too high, and Johnson was worn down by worry and frustration. Well, you know, all the time when I was working on it and thinking... Am I going to be here? Am I, you know, what's going to happen to me? Uh, it's very stressful. You know, it's, you're always on edge. You're always on edge. It never goes away. Johnson was close to losing her home. Then she saw a newspaper story about federal legislation that might help her. She called Senator Carl Levin's office, and they told Johnson about the Wayne County Mortgage Foreclosure Prevention Program. She was one of the first clients. They helped her get a fixed-rate mortgage at the original terms and saved her home. Now, less than two years later, Johnson works for the program. She helps others save their homes. Judith Margram is a psychologist in Southfield. She says no one is immune to the foreclosure crisis. It's affecting middle class, upper class. It doesn't matter what class it is. Um, CEOs are losing their jobs, and then they're faced with huge mortgages that they have to find a way to either manage or get into a smaller place and readjust their entire lifestyle. Um, So I'm seeing a huge amount of stress and anxiety related to that. Margram says that stress and anxiety can affect the entire family. Sometimes they try to pretend like everything's normal and there's no stress, but it comes out in other ways because they're irritable, they yell at the children more, um, and the children just pick up on the tension. And so they may bring the children in because they're not behaving well, they're having sleeping problems or the children are depressed and sad. Margram says that many people going through the foreclosure process feel like they're letting others down. They're embarrassed and ashamed. For men particularly, or single parents, there's a sense that they're not doing their job, that they're a failure now. How could they possibly lose their job, lose their house? And, you know, they're not doing, taking care of their responsibilities in the family. And that's a huge issue for people. Some relationships are destroyed by the financial stress. But Margram says sometimes people discover something. They find a new connection to their family, their faith, and their community. We got away from that because you had to work 60 hours a week to pay your mortgage. And then you had to drive your kids 14 different places because you thought that's what you should do and take them out to expensive dinners when really people are finding that it's more fun to sit home and play Monopoly or it's more fun to have a picnic in the backyard and that you don't have to spend all that money. Margram and Johnson both say if you're facing foreclosure, do something. Contact your lender, call 211, find a counselor. Not opening the mail or not answering the phone won't make foreclosure go away. I'm Rena Miller. As we just heard, the emotional cost alone can wreak havoc on people facing foreclosure. But a new law in Michigan is meant to help people avoid that emotional trauma and help people stay in their homes. Rick Pluta covers the state capitol for the Michigan Public Radio Network, and he joins me now from Lansing. Rick, tell me about the new state law. 
Well, there are really two laws or sets of laws, Christina. The first thing the legislature tried to do was to go after the predatory lenders. Those are the ones who sell loans with complex terms and ballooning rates to people who couldn't necessarily afford them. And that's what we just heard about in Rena's piece. The state now licenses lenders and can decommission the bad actors. Um, here's Republican State Senator Randy Richard, though. The industry was uh, not regulated at all, and uh, we put together what I would call right regulation, followed up that with uh, what the federal government required us to do. Then the legislature went to work on, on the more controversial aspect, and that's delaying foreclosures to give people some time to come up with a plan for saving their homes. So now when someone gets a foreclosure notice, they also get a letter that outlines their rights and a list of state-approved credit counselors. The homeowner has 14 days to contact a counselor. The counselor has 10 days to get in touch with the lender to put a hold on the foreclosure proceedings for 90 days from the date the default notice was sent to the homeowner. Now, in that time, the lender, the homeowner, and the counselor will try to come up with, with more affordable terms. But... While the banks have to negotiate, there's nothing outlining what sorts of modifications they have to offer, although they can be taken to court for refusing to negotiate. Rick, will this new policy actually help people? I mean, is this the answer to the foreclosure problem? All it really gives them is time. And, and, and lawmakers recognize the limitations of what they could do about this. They could use the state's licensing power to get the predatory lenders out of the market, and they they could require lenders to negotiate with borrowers and create some certainty for everyone involved. But as we hear from State Representative Andy Kaloris, a, a Democrat, that they can't put money in people's pockets to make their payments. Uh, I think that if this legislation is used properly, we're going to avoid uh, a lot of foreclosures. There will be many, many more that we will not be able to avoid because if someone is completely out of work, uh, cannot find a job, and cannot make any payment on a mortgage, uh, you know, there's nothing that we can do for them at this point. But for people who maybe can get themselves out of trouble, they have to face the reality of their situation. What, what else is being proposed on the state level? Well, like we just heard, lawmakers kind of feel they've taken it to the limit on the policy side. Uh, the activist group ACORN is calling for a straight-up moratorium on foreclosures for two years, but, but that doesn't seem likely at this juncture. But because this is so new, we don't really know yet what's working and what's not working in terms of loan modification plans. So some people say we also need a mechanism for collecting success stories and, and failures. Well, Rick, thanks very much for talking with us about this. Oh, my pleasure, Christine. Rick Pluta covers the state capitol. Coming up in about 10 minutes. It's going to hurt my neighbors and friends. It's going to hurt the community. And, you know, that's not something that I want to necessarily be contributing to. But at some point, you have to be able to, to make those decisions of, you know, what's really the best thing for, you know, for me and my family versus, you know, every, everyone else around me. We'll find out what happens when people who are facing foreclosure just pack up and walk away. This is Facing the Mortgage Crisis from Michigan Radio.
From Michigan Radio, this is Facing the Mortgage Crisis. I'm Christina Shockley. States and communities across the nation are taking steps to reduce the number of foreclosures and deal with the effects. Indiana, for example, wants pro bono lawyers to give free legal advice to people who need help. The Detroit suburb of Farmington now fines mortgage lenders if they don't mow the lawn and pick up trash at their foreclosed properties in an effort to combat blight. Foreclosed properties reduce the values of other homes in the community. And if houses sit empty for too long, they attract vandalism and crime. But a new federal program is providing millions of dollars to help stabilize these neighborhoods. Vincent Duffy reports. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning. morning. Can everybody just step forward for me, please, so we can talk a little bit? Everybody have gloves, everybody have dust masks. John George is standing in front of a giant pile of rubble on a residential street in northwest Detroit. He's giving instructions to about 40 volunteers. Most of them are kids from Ann Arbor. And they're helping him clear a demolished home. I want you guys to start now with these cans, loading everything up except the wood, okay? George runs a group called Blight Busters. It's using some of the $47 million the federal government has poured into Detroit as part of its neighborhood stabilization program. The Blight Busters use the money to tear down vacant houses. Blight is like a cancer. It's important that you nip it in the bud before it spreads and kills the rest of the neighborhood. This particular house was a home for many, many years, became vacant, and then became a nuisance uh, with people in and out. And uh, It is our goal to fill in the hole, grade the lot, put up a white picket fence, and create a neighborhood gathering place. Only California and Florida got more stabilization money than Michigan, and a second round of grants is underway. George hopes much of the new money will come to the Blightbusters. We're looking for some significant dollars to uh, allow us to not only continue, but really put this neighborhood back on a strong foundation. Only 6% of the stabilization money across the country is being used to tear houses down. But Detroit is using a third of its money for demolition, and more than 3,000 vacant homes were demolished last year. Kevin Vitrano is the Community and Economic Development Planner at Southeast Michigan Council of Governments. He says in a major urban area, like Detroit, that's losing jobs and population, a vacant home in a neighborhood can have a domino effect. One turns into two, turns into three, and no one wants to be on those blocks that have that sign that says foreclosure, has, you know, the high grass. It spreads like wildfire in this kind of economy. But not all the neighborhood stabilization money in Michigan is used to tear houses down. Petrano says in many communities outside Detroit, the money is used to make sure that vacant homes don't look vacant. We're seeing a lot more of that going on, the code enforcement really getting that proactive approach before it gets to a point where properties abandon. I'm standing on the front porch of a vacant foreclosed home on Holly Road in Fenton. If it weren't for the notice on the windows, you wouldn't know this house was different from any other house in the neighborhood. The grass is cut, the windows have glass in them, there's no trash or debris around except for the garden hose still attached to the side of the house. Those types of aesthetic things I think are very important so that they don't negatively impact the neighborhood. Lynn Markland is the city manager for Fenton. He says because the city is small, they can enforce the codes on vacant properties. We don't allow the homes to be boarded up, and we're also very aggressive about making sure the lawn is kept mowed. Uh, You can't necessarily just drive down the neighborhood and see homes boarded up. Fenton only received $330,000 in neighborhood stabilization money, but it's using most of the money to buy for closed homes, fix them up, and sell them to families who will live in them. Markland says they aren't allowed to make a profit on the homes, but they do recycle the money. Once the house is sold, the money comes back into our pool of money. The money gets recycled into another project. Uh, We hope to do about six homes a year. Those six homes are only 10% of the roughly 60 foreclosed homes sitting vacant in Fenton right now. But it is a start, and Markland says they buy and sell the homes they believe will have the most stabilizing effect on a neighborhood. The next round of neighborhood stabilization money is scheduled to arrive at the end of the summer. And whether cities use the money to tear homes down or fix them up for sale, the goal is to make sure that when a home goes into foreclosure, the rest of the neighborhood doesn't suffer as well. I'm Vincent Duffy. Detroit has one of the worst foreclosure rates in the country. But just a couple of years ago, Cleveland was in the same position. We were probably at the epicenter for foreclosures at one time before, actually before it hit all over the country. Since then, the city has made some progress in that department with a new program it rolled out earlier this year. 
Jennifer Guerra went to Cleveland to check it out. Rehab, demo, prevention. That's how Cleveland plans to fix its foreclosure problem. The goal is to rehab 150 vacant homes, demolish 300, and prevent another 300 homes from going into foreclosure by helping at-risk homeowners get their loans modified. It's all part of a program called Opportunity Homes. The program has a three-year budget of over $6 million, a third of it from public funds and the rest private. Uh, You know, I'm still hopeful, but I'm not proclaiming a huge victory yet. That's Frank Ford. He's vice president of Neighborhood Progress Incorporated. It's one of the main groups behind Opportunity Homes. He says rehab and demolition are one thing, but the foreclosure prevention part... It's not easy to engage people and convince them that they have a problem if their loan hasn't reset yet. Once it resets and their loan payment goes from 800 to 1200 a month, I think, you know, probably getting their attention is a little easier. But we're trying to approach people who aren't even in trouble yet. In order to do that, Ford turns to a guy named Mike Schramm. Schramm is a programmer analyst at the Center on Urban Poverty and Community Development at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland. Since 1988, the center has been collecting and analyzing data from a bunch of Ohio neighborhoods, like this one in Cleveland, called Slavic Village. Okay, I'll just, to, to make things simple, we'll skip to a, a Slavic Village map that summarizes what's going on. So we see property, address, ward, the city it's in. The We're also able to see which homes have subprime loans and high-cost loans. That's all public record. We can also see which homes have their water turned off. That indicates a vacancy. And thanks to some proprietary data Opportunity Homes bought for $10,000, we can also see which homes in the neighborhood have adjustable rate mortgages that are going to reset sometime in the next two years. So Shram takes all of that data, crunches some numbers, puts it into a spreadsheet, and then prints it out along with a color-coded map of the neighborhood and sends it to this guy. Hi, uh, my name's Jimmy, and I'm working with ESOP, and we're partnering with Slavic Village, and we're just in the neighborhood passing on information if anyone has issues with their house payments or if you know someone in the neighborhood that might be having an issue. Jimmy Rudick is with the foreclosure prevention group um, ESOP. It stands for Empowering and Strengthening Ohio's People. Rudick takes the list that Schramm sends over from Case Western, and he uses it to figure out which doors to knock on in order to offer help. I mean, there's always the few homeowners who have the specific answer of, you know, who are you, what are you doing, I might shut the door, I don't need it, you know, the, I mean, rightfully so. But then we also get some people who said, you know, a lot of times this is what I've been waiting for, or this is, you know, a call from God. Rudick didn't get any of those reactions the day I tagged along. But according to a Cleveland State University study, ESOP has over an 80 percent foreclosure prevention success rate. That's most likely due to ESOP's community organizing tactics. They like to drop hundreds of plastic sharks on banks that don't cooperate with loan modifications. They also once put up flyers with a phone number and the words, Call Angelo, on it. Turns out Angelo was Angelo Mazzillo, the chief executive of Countrywide Financial, who's also now the target of a federal investigation. The number on the flyer was his cell phone. When I got back to Michigan, I asked Steve Bancroft over at the Detroit Office of Foreclosure Prevention and Response if they've got a similar plan in the works. In a word, yes. Even though we don't go out and publicize it a great deal, the results are what is important. So what are the results? (laughs) That's hard to say at this point. Uh, Things are happening. Things are uh, being done. There'll be a lot more information available as we go forward. Bancroft wouldn't reveal much more, except that unlike Cleveland's six-neighborhood approach, Detroit's plan targets the entire city, all 140 square miles of it. He also says they've got lots of data to sift through, and there's a website in the works which will be unveiled soon. I'm Jennifer Guerra. Some homeowners who find themselves unable to afford their mortgages will be able to get help from federal programs, and others are able to work out loan modifications or arrange short sales with their lenders. But there's another group of people who don't qualify for that assistance and who face the difficult decision of whether to walk away from their homes. 
Sarah Hewlett reports. Tim Westman says he considers himself a responsible homeowner. I didn't buy more home than I could afford. I put 20% down uh, on the home. I had a fixed rate mortgage. I made all my payments regularly, was continuing to build equity. Uh, you know, I put more than $100,000 into the home over the last seven or eight years. And I still figure if I were to sell today, I would be probably $50,000 underwater on that home. Westman moved out of this Lake Orion subdivision about nine months ago because of a family situation. The streets are dotted with for sale signs that have been up for months and in some cases years. These houses over here on the lakeside uh, were selling a couple years ago for you know, between six and seven hundred thousand dollars. Westman uh, points out a big lakefront house with a moving van out front. He says the owners have been dropping the price for three uh, years. They had four twenty-five, I think, on it most recently, and couldn't get anything. So uh, they're packing up. They're taking everything that's left in the house, and they're walking away. Westman stops the car, and we get out. Movers are hauling boxes and furniture onto the truck. Inside, Annalee Matheson is packing up. She says it's been a rough morning. I cried all my makeup off. So. <laughs> Three years ago, Matheson's husband took a job in Florida. Annalee and their two sons stayed behind for a year trying to sell the house. But the separation was too difficult. So she and the kids moved to Florida, and the house stayed on the market. And now here we are two years later. The house hasn't sold. It's only gone down in value. There's no way we can ever come back here. There's no work in construction. So, yeah, we... We're basically walking away. Matheson says she's tried to get the bank to work out a deal, but she says her lender isn't interested. It's funny. We feel like we're penalized because we did everything right. We put the huge down payment. We kept up with our payments. And for what? No bank, large or small, wants to foreclose. You know, we, we always lose money when that happens. That's Doug Chafin. He's the president of Monroe Bank and Trust, and for the past year he's been president of the Michigan Bankers Association. Chafin says at least half the time his bank is able to work out a deal to avoid foreclosure, but he says walkaways are becoming a problem. Historically, we might have one or two situations like that a year in our case, and we're seeing it every month now. Chafin says homeowners who decide to mail their house keys to the bank should know that walking away doesn't necessarily mean they're off the financial hook. Even if they abandon it, even if they stop making payments, um, they are responsible for any shortfall between the balance of that mortgage and what the bank might obtain in liquidation. But homeowners like the Mathesons in Lake Orion say the value of their house has fallen so far and they've put so much money into it, they don't think they'll owe the bank anything. Tim Westman, the Mathesons' former neighbor, is still deciding what he'll do about his house. But he says it's not his obligation to the bank he's most worried about. It's going to hurt my neighbors and friends. It's going to hurt the community. And, you know, that's not something that I want to necessarily be contributing to. Uh, but like I say, you know, at some point you have to be able to, to make those decisions of, you know, what's really the best thing for, you know, for me and my family versus, you know, every, everyone else around me. Westman has been able to rent out his house since he and his family moved out. But his tenant works for Chrysler and has a house in St. Louis that he hasn't been able to sell. So Westman says he's just waiting it out for now and hoping his delicate arrangement will last through the downturn. I'm Sarah Hewlett in Lake Orion. If you're facing the possibility of foreclosure, or if you're just trying to get help cutting your credit card bill, there are a lot of companies out there that say they can help you. But in Michigan, some of these companies just want to scam you. Dustin Dwyer explains what to look out for if you get an offer for help. Last fall, Shirley Mann Sandoval's mortgage payment jumped at the same time her son got sick. She tried to get help from her mortgage company to lower the bill, but they wouldn't help. Then she saw an ad for a company called Federal Loan Modification. She gave them a call. Initially, we had to pay $795 to start it, and then they wanted another $795 on top of that. This is the part where if Man Sandoval's life were a movie, you'd be hearing really scary music. 
Because a company that asks to be paid up front is a big warning sign. In fact, it's illegal in Michigan for any company that offers mortgage or other credit help to collect payment up front. Unfortunately for Shirley Mann Sandoval, no one told her that. The person who claimed to be helping her, Rick Landeros, eventually moved to a company called Equify Enterprises and charged her even more money. Rick Landeros declined to speak on tape, but he told me he no longer works for Equify, and as far as he knows, it's closed. Landeros told me he's sorry Man Sandoval didn't get help, but he says his job was just to put information in a file and collect payment. He says he didn't know it was illegal to collect payment up front. This kind of scheme has ensnared many people in Michigan, and you don't have to be in foreclosure trouble to get caught up in it. Just ask Caleb Sanders. I had never missed the house payment, nor was I ever late. But Sanders was in an adjustable rate mortgage, and as that rate went up, Sanders started having trouble paying his credit cards. That's when he got a call from a company called Lifeguard Financial with news that they could help. But Sanders told the man on the phone that he didn't have any money to pay for that help. So he said, oh, we can work out a way. He says, "Miss, you can miss two house payments, you know, to pay us. The man on the phone, who said his name was Fred Mendez, told Sanders those two payments would get added on the back of the loan. But that never happened. Instead, Sanders started getting foreclosure notices. Lifeguard Financial did not respond to requests for comment. They crooks, man. They scammed me out of my money. It it ought to really be something done about that. And that's where Michigan Attorney General Mike Cox comes in. Recently, Cox's office announced 18 counts of fraud for foreclosure relief operations. The office also requested information from 17 other companies where there have been complaints of fraud. But none of those companies were the companies that scammed Caleb Sanders and Shirley Mann Sandoval. So the problem clearly isn't solved. In fact, some are worried that it will get worse. Karen Chapkiss is with Legal Aid of West Michigan. Chapkiss says she's seen hundreds of fraud cases. And she says one of the provisions in Michigan's new foreclosure law could help scammers. The provision requires lenders to post in the newspaper the names and addresses of people who could be in foreclosure. And unlike in the past, that information has to be published weeks before the foreclosure process actually begins. We've known for years that the scammers are picking up those lists and contacting those people. And I think this is just going to give the scammers earlier access to folks. One legislator who was involved in writing the new law says the goal of the newspaper notice is to reach people who ignore their mail notices and phone calls. He said lawmakers didn't know about the scam risk, but he'd look into fixing it. In the meantime, the best protection is just for homeowners to be aware of the warning signs. Never pay anyone up front. Never pay for help at all if you don't have to. Free help is available from counselors certified by the Michigan State Housing Development Authority and through the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. In Grand Rapids, I'm Dustin Dwyer. Coming up, one couple nearly loses the house and land that's been in their family for more than 100 years. We try to be good people. I think we're good people. It just happen. And it wasn't because we just were lazy or didn't want to do anything. It was just, it just got away from us. That story in about 15 minutes. It's Facing the Mortgage Crisis from Michigan Radio.
From Michigan Radio, this is Facing the Mortgage Crisis. I'm Christina Shockley. This hour, we're taking a look at the foreclosure crisis and what happens after someone loses their home. Regina Myrie lost two homes after her husband died. I spoke with her last year. It's hard for a person to go from A1 credit to feeling like you're a failure and just to try to keep your head up. What really struck me about Regina Myrie was her persistence. She was going to learn from these experiences and help others. Today, she organizes counseling forums, and she says things are looking up. I'm on my way to, um, per, you know, purchasing another home, and um, I am still doing everything I can to try to help others, um, just to let them know that they're not alone and that, um, again, there is life after foreclosure. That's, that's where I'm at right now. There is life. Um, back then, I think... Not to say that I thought that it was going to be over, but I knew that there was something else better, and it is. It's it's getting better, and um, and it will for others who are experiencing this as well. We're finding more and more people now. They're not so afraid to talk about it, and they are learning that it's not about my care. You know, it's not about um, the things that I have or possess, and so through this, even through this economy, as it's rippling all the way around. Um, with the auto industries and everything, and people are losing jobs. Um, They're also, of course, having to lose their homes, and they're now realizing that, you know what, it's okay. Regina Myrie lives in Ypsilanti. She's just one example of someone helping others with foreclosure. Another example is the distressed property expert. That's a fairly new specialty that's cropped up because of the foreclosure crisis. It's someone who lends a hand to troubled homeowners, but not necessarily to keep families in their homes. Steve Carmody reports. But at least I will give them credit that they did make a decision before the end of the day. Realtor Pete Maxfield stands in his new office in South Lyon. There's no furniture yet, and it needs paint, but the phones are ringing. Right. Well, we're back, when you get back, we can. You know, we have a few days on that other property. Uh, Maxfield has been a realtor for more than a decade, but lately he says the percentage of foreclosed homes he handles has quadrupled. Dealing with people on the verge of foreclosure, Maxfield recently underwent training to become a certified distressed property expert. Distressed property experts don't help people keep their homes. By the time most homeowners are ready to seek help, it's already too late. Maxfield says he tries to help people navigate the system so they can short sell their homes. Short selling means the home is sold for less than what's owed to the bank. We want to get these homes sold. No one wants to own these homes for any length of time. We want to get them back out there where people are living in them as quickly as as possible. Hopefully, if the bank sees that there is someone who has this designation, that that will work a little faster. William Lamb is one of Maxfield's clients. In the past few years, Lamb's wife suffered a serious illness. He placed his mother in an assisted living center. He sent a son off to college. Then he lost his job of more than 30 years. As the bills piled up, Lamb fell behind in his payments on the home equity loan on his parents' home. He couldn't navigate the Byzantine maze of banking regulations without help. I worked in a book bindery for 31 years. That's my only training in life. You know, I know how to fold books or fold paper up into books, I know how to do that. But that's, you know, as far as understanding real estate or anything, I'm lost. Lamb says his distressed property expert helped guide him through the process, trying to sell the home before it was lost to foreclosure. Recently, though, the bank rejected a short sale offer on the house, and the home was sold at a sheriff's sale. While the National Association of Realtors encourages its members to get distressed property training, the association does not have any standards for the level of training realtors should have. And not everyone is happy to see the rise of distressed property experts. Denny Miller is the president of the Michigan Mortgage Lenders Association. He says many so-called experts offering to help people with short sales today are the same experts who sold people mortgages they couldn't afford and shouldn't have gotten in the first place. And so they're trying to attract some of the same people who uh, are now in trouble looking for modification, looking for relief of some kind, but they're charging 
heavy fees to basically direct these people to loan modifications, which would not require any fees at all if, if they s were able to seek those modifications out directly from their servicer. Miller says homeowners should take advantage of programs offered by their mortgage lenders to avert foreclosure or to get out from under with the least damage to their credit rating. Distressed property expert Pete Maxfield agrees, but he says it doesn't hurt people to have an ombudsman like him who know the system. And given Michigan's economy, Pete Maxfield expects his services will be needed for some time to come. I'm Steve Carmody in Ann Arbor. As we've learned, for some people, foreclosure can't be avoided. And if so, life after foreclosure needs to be dealt with. Heather Mooney is a foreclosure prevention officer in the Washtenaw County Treasurer's Office. Although her title says she prevents foreclosures, part of her job is helping people through them. She says foreclosure hurts a person's credit rating, so they're usually out of the market as a homeowner for about five years. Post-foreclosure homeowners have a couple different routes. Some do relocate with family. Some are moving out of state and choosing, you know, just to scrap the whole Michigan deal. Uh, other homeowners are definitely relocating into rental housing as well as apartments, sometimes even townhouses. Mooney says renting is usually not a problem. In fact, one effect of the foreclosure crisis is banks, businesses, and landlords might have to be more lenient. Mooney says landlords have chosen to let some things slide because they have to. A lot of the companies and even individual landlords at this time, I've heard, have been waiving security deposits and application fees. And she says some rental companies aren't paying as much attention to credit ratings as they used to. Kent Spencer is a foreclosure specialist with the Wayne County Mortgage Foreclosure Program. He says sometimes it's just a matter of asking for help. And it's a difficult transition. Pride gets in the way and sometimes a depression and other things. But the thing is you've got to at least let people know that you're, you know, uh, having some trouble swimming right now so that a life uh, preserver can be thrown out to you. We've been hearing a lot of stories that go like this. A family or individual gets hit with a huge illness or injury and, as a result, can't handle both the health care expenses and the mortgage. So we wanted to take a closer look at the relationship between health care costs and foreclosures. Larry Gant is a professor at the University of Michigan School of Social Work. Professor Gant, what is the relationship between health care costs and the high foreclosure rate? It's a pretty straightforward kind of association. And it's really a decision that a lot of people, unfortunately, are having to make. And that is this. If I'm ill or very ill, catastrophically ill, and am faced with losing my house, which is more important, my health or my housing? That's the major driving question. And what we see happening is that people are actually creating their own on-the-street policy right then and there. If their health is more important, then they're walking away from their home to take care of their health. If their home is more important, then they are foregoing any kind of health care, responsible health care, because their home is more important for them. So they're forced to make those two kinds of decisions. They're making those kinds of decisions, and there are real dire consequences. Now, one of the things that we found out last year was that many people were going into foreclosure because of the subprime mortgage mess. Now so, it's more because of unemployment. And most of the time, insurance is associated with jobs. So if people are losing their jobs, then they're also losing their health insurance. Well, very interesting and very true. Unfortunately, a lot, not all, but an awful lot of health care is provided through employment. That, that was a kind of a deal with the devil, if you will, or a best-case scenario back in the middle 30s and 40s when the auto industry said, we've got to provide some way to pay for health care. As an auto industry, we will provide that. So that for the first time, health care, health insurance was linked with employment. And that's trickled down. So even with, even with people, even with businesses where there, there's not a union per se, there's an expectation that you will receive health care benefits or health care insurance through your employment. If you have no job, you've got some other options to purchase insurance, but they're marginal, they're very expensive, and they're not for everybody. If we had universal health care, how do you think it would affect the foreclosure crisis? I think in a positive world, in a best-of-all-cases world, people would not have to worry about their health. They could focus on providing 
a way to negotiate reasonable mortgage, reasonable cost for paying for their homes. So you get rid of very, very nicely a major worry, a major issue, which is health care. Do you have to pay for it? No, it's taken care of. So I can then concentrate all of my time, all of my effort into resolving the mortgage issue, whether it's a lower mortgage, whether it's a refinance, or whether it's thinking about other housing options. Well, Professor Gant, thank you very much for talking with me. Thank you for inviting me. Larry Gant is a professor of social work at the University of Michigan. Whether it's after an illness, a death in the family, or the loss of a job, people who never thought they'd find their house at risk are finding themselves in foreclosure. Sometimes people are able to avoid foreclosure with the help of a housing counselor. Counselors are free, and they're provided by the state. Paula Braun and her husband Brad avoided foreclosure. They were helped by their housing counselor, Kathy Grant. Paula and Brad live in South Lyon on land that's belonged to the family since the 1900s. Paula Braun shows us around the property and shares her story. Deli, come. Good boy. We got cucumbers and radishes and green beans and beets. This home and this property means everything to me. I mean, this is huge. It's been in the family for over 100 years. Well, we started running into problems last June, I would say. My husband's hours got cut. I have a medical condition, and it was costing us a fortune a month, and then the bills kept piling up, and then they kept raising the prices of everything, and his hours kept getting cut more and more. He lost his insurance at work. It was really, really difficult because, I mean, we, we, we try to be good people. I think we're good people. It just happened, and it wasn't because we just were lazy or didn't want to do anything. It was just, it just got away from us with the medical and his cut hours. You know, it all just kind of snowballed all at once, and you're in trouble before you know it. The lowest time in all of this, I think, was, and I'm probably going to start crying, we were in Kathy Grant's office, and my dad had passed away the weekend before, and it was a Monday, and she was trying to deal with the mortgage company, and they weren't giving her any answers because they had sent us letters from their lawyers, and she was trying to deal with them, and they weren't helping her, and it was like, see, this is what I've been telling everyone. This is what we're going through. We can't get an answer, and it was like... Oh, it was it was just awful. And we left there, and she said, she kept telling us, don't worry, I will get an answer for you. But she couldn't. She tried for two and a half hours we were there, and she couldn't get any answers at first. But she did. <laughs> she didn't quit. And finally, the day before the sheriff's sale, they called me and said, okay, we're, we're going to make this deal. I'm faxing you over something. If you sign it and have Brad sign it and get it back to me. Finally. I mean, it was like 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and the sheriff's sale was at 9 o'clock the next morning. Being on the verge of losing it, it oh, I think I almost had a nervous breakdown. I, it, it was that hard because I knew I would never get another chance to, to have this property again if we lost it. I just knew it, and it, it just felt like I had let my family down. It really was bad. You know, it's like my grandmother lived through the depression and she didn't lose it. How can I lose it? It was that it was it was really, really difficult. Actually feels like we've been through hell, but we actually came out the other side. And we're gonna be okay. Paula Braun is one of the fortunate ones. She was able to save her family farm where she still lives. I'm Jack Lessonberry. The first house I ever owned was a stylish 1950s ranch with a deep backyard on a leafy suburban street. It had magnificent cathedral ceilings and a fireplace. This was in 1978. I'd been married for a little over a year and it cost what seemed like an astronomical amount of money. $61,000. Somehow we came up with it and made many memories in that house. Eventually, when I'd outgrown it and had a different job, I moved to a bigger house. But I've always been a little bit in love with that first one in the way you always remember a first love, and a few weeks ago I decided to find out what had happened to it. To my shock, it was in foreclosure. I couldn't believe it. Thanks to the Internet, I found that it had last changed hands for $148,000 a couple of years ago. Now the bank wanted a mere $54,900 for it. With inflation factored in, it was worth less than a third of what I bought it for. I decided to go see the old place. 
The neighborhood was still nice. From the street, the house looked the same, or almost the same. The contours of the landscaping my wife had planned were still there, as were the Japanese maples she'd planted, though they were overgrown. But the built-in barbecue in the back had been wrecked, apparently on purpose. An expensive fence was destroyed. The gutters were a mess, partly stripped and with trees growing out of them. A stained-glass window had been smashed. I met the lady next door. Who'd been living here, I wanted to know. A woman and her son, she said. Eventually she died and he lost his job and couldn't keep up with the payments. The bank wouldn't make a deal, she said, so he left. I wondered if he'd wrecked the barbecue on the way out. I felt as if I were looking at the corpse of a loved one. The week before, I'd bought another house with a close friend who could not do so without a cosigner. That house had gone on the market for $399,000. She got it for 219000 but though she has essentially perfect credit, she couldn't have bought it on her own. If she'd bought this house five years ago, could she have gotten a loan? I asked someone at the closing. Your dog could have gotten a loan, he sighed. That was a problem. Back then, I had a student who was suckered into a no-interest mortgage with a balloon loan. Of course, she and her husband lost the house. That's happening to thousands in the state every month. I don't know the solution. I only know we ought to find one. For years, our government actively encouraged people to buy homes. Home ownership made for stable neighborhoods and societies. I think most elected officials still believe that. So, why haven't we done more to keep those buyers in their homes when times get hard? If that isn't worth spending some money on, I don't know what is. Jack Lessonberry is Michigan Radio's political analyst. Realty Track says more than one and a half million homes in the U.S. were threatened with foreclosure during the first half of 2009. One in 74 Michigan homes spent part of that time in foreclosure. If you or someone you know is facing foreclosure, we want you to know that there are options and people who can help you sort through them. You can dial 211 for assistance or look at our list of resources at facingthemortgagecrisis.org. Foreclosure or the possibility of foreclosure is life-changing, but ignoring the problem won't help. And as we've heard this hour, there is life after foreclosure. Facing the Mortgage Crisis was produced by Tamar Charney with help from Zoe Clark. Reporting by Steve Carmody, Vincent Duffy, Dustin Dwyer, Jennifer Guerra, Sarah Hewlett, Rena Miller, Kyle Norris, and Rick Pluta. Essay by Jack Lessenberry. Production assistance from Colleen Castle, Tara Cavanaugh, and Meg Young. Special thanks to indie bands A Setting Sun, Saccio, Paucity, Talk Fine, and Tokyo Morose for use of their music. I'm Christina Shockley. This documentary is a production of Michigan Radio, a broadcasting service of the University of Michigan. Support for Michigan Radio's Facing the Mortgage Crisis comes from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Facing the Mortgage Crisis is part of CPB's Public Service Media Economic Response Initiative.